Good morning. Are you all all right? Yep. Good. Good, good. Thanks for having me. Aaron invited me months ago, I think it was. Very well organised, obviously, as a, a church, which is fantastic. And uh, just great to be able to come um, and be here this morning with you. Um, my role in Derby City Mission kind of can take me all over the place, speaking to lots of different churches. So I've you know, I've been in uh, Hina Baptist Church, spoke there. I remember speaking in a very small Anglican church up in Derbyshire somewhere that was also a post office as well as a church because there was no other facilities in this little village. And then actually a couple of weekends ago, um, I had the privilege of um, actually going to a Quaker meeting up in Chesterfield. Um, now you can't, they don't tend to invite you to speak because if you know anything about the Quakers, they don't tend to speak very much it's all about waiting on the Lord but that was just a real different experience of, um, of worshipping God in the silence and so we pretty much met for an hour in silence which um, Jed who was with me here this morning he came with me there and uh, it was a real kind of challenge really to think how that's going to work or what that's going to look like but it was, it's just great to be able to go around and be with lots of different um, kind of expressions of God's church and again here this morning it's great so um, Aaron kind of said, come and talk a bit about Derby City Mission, come and talk a bit about the Word as well, because that's always a good thing to do. And uh, if I'm honest, I'm probably not going to talk that much about Derby City Mission. Um, many of you already, I know, uh, are involved in different ways with Derby City Mission, which is fantastic. Um, City Missions as a whole kind of started all the way back in 1826, up in Glasgow, uh, of all places in the country. And then um, next year, Derby City Mission is actually going to be celebrating its 30th year of being here. So a wonderful guy who was obedient to God called Jeff Holland uh, chose to leave London City Mission and came up to Derby because he believed God had spoke to him and started uh, Derby City Mission almost 30 years ago. So next year is our Pearl anniversary um, and we're busy planning some very large celebration and um, plans for next weekend I think next year from what I understand at the moment we're looking at maybe a whole weekend worth of celebrations rather than just one evening so I don't know exactly what's got plans but it's already happening and already going on so as I said before when Carissa was interviewing me um, I'm the head of relief of poverty um, we kind of a few years ago kind of just reorganized ourselves within Derby City Mission um, so I have a number of different projects that come under my kind of authority and oversight. Um, so one of those is Derby Church's Night Shelter, which I know some of you are involved in. And I hope we're going to see you back again this year because it's a fantastic thing to do. Um, and I know we say it a lot as Derby City Mission, but we cannot do what we do without the people who volunteer with us. Um, there's not actually that many of us on staff and when we talk to other agencies and other organizations not just in the city but in the country I cannot believe how much derby city mission can do out there in the community with different people and we say actually it's all down to our amazing volunteers so there i think there's something like 30 different city missions around the country and um last year we um I was invited to go along to their national conference, British Association of City Missions, and um, we just began to share stories and different things that we were doing. And uh, one of the things that became apparent is that in Derby, we're really blessed with our volunteers because of all the city missions across the country, of which we've talked about 30, some of them very big, like London City Mission. Uh, Derby City Mission actually has a quarter of all the volunteers that city missions have across the whole of the country because there are so many willing people here in Derby, which is just fantastic. We've got at the moment somewhere between four to 500 people who are giving some time either each week or each couple of weeks or each month to come and be part of what we're doing at Derby City Mission. As um, Alex at the beginning just shared our, our vision statement you know, we, we, we recognise we cannot do this on our own. We've never looked Derby City Mission to do things on our own. We're always keen to work in partnership. And that's what we're always looking to do. Um, and so we're looking to work in partnership with the church and different churches who want to work with us. Um, and our work is beginning to take us out of the city, more into the county. Um, and so within the last kind of 18 months, my role has been much more about how can we help the church in Derbyshire, not just in the city, 
Um, be effective, be reaching out to people, be caring for people, and sharing the good news of Jesus. You know, we're really keen to do that as well. So this morning, uh, I want to speak to you from a passage which I feel like God has laid on my heart for you here at Springwood. Um, it was from Matthew 14, as Alex read, the feeding of the 5,000. I love this story. Um, a really well-known story. Many people who don't maybe even come to church very often or don't have much <laughs> contact with Christians um, even know this story. People have heard of this story. It's such a, a well-known story. And uh, one of the things as I began uh, just studying and researching and, you know, get preparing for this morning is that this is the only miracle that appears in all four of the Gospels. So it appears in Matthew chapter 14, as we've read, in Mark chapter 6, in Luke chapter 9, and John chapter 6 as well. It's the only one that appears. And yet when you reach, read each of, the, um, each of the different stories from each of the different Gospels, it's slightly different. The story is slightly different. And I was thinking, oh dear, what? That's not good, is it? All the, it's got a slightly different take on it. Maybe there's some inaccuracies here. Maybe there's something that's not quite right. But then I was um, reminded of, um, of situations and circumstances in our day. We've got, um, as I said before, we've got four children of our own and we foster as well, which is a great adventure, um, to say the least. And, um, but sometimes our three eldest children all go to the same school and they'll all come home at the end of the day and they'll tell us about their day and what's gone on. And uh, when they come home, they, they might all have witnessed and experienced a situation at school. It might have been a fight, unfortunately, or something happening at school and they'll all come back and report on it. And when they come back and report on it, it's always slightly different. And that's the case with this story of the feeding of the 5,000. You know, the four different reports of it are all slightly different. But why wouldn't it be? Because we all can take something different away. I'm sure, you know, from a, hopefully, from this morning, you'll take something away from it. And it might be something completely different for each of us. And so that's our experiences and how we view things and how we see things. And so it's just great to know that this passage is significant, I really believe, because it appears in all four Gospels. And um, it was always important, I think, to put the passage in context. That says intro, just there. Sorry, where the light is. So that's a bit of the intro. And then just the context as well. Um, so if we look in the passage that we read, or Alex read to us, um, when Jesus heard what had happened. So immediately I'm like, oh, well, what did happen? And if we look just back prior to those verses, um, it's a story actually of... of John the Baptist, um, and actually, uh, sadly, how he, was, how he was killed. And John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. So that probably is quite a big deal, that John the Baptist has just had his head cut off and sadly lost his life. And um, I would suggest it's probably not the best time for Jesus. He's just learned about this. It tells you in the passage before that John the Baptist's um, disciples came and shared the news with Jesus and let him know what had happened. And um, it just made me begin to think about, I wonder how I behave in a crisis when I get some bad news and something devastating happens, um, you know, when we aren't feeling our best. Um, and when we read this passage, the first thing that Jesus does is he withdraws. He takes himself off. He takes himself off to a solitary place. He wanted to be on his own. He wanted to spend that time grieving, to understand what it meant to have lost John. Which, you know, for me, I just think totally understandable. You know, when I get bad news, when something really bad happens, um, I want to, you know, you might not want to be totally on your own, but you want to be surrounded by people who you really know love you and care about you. And, you know, you want to just be able to take that time to be sad. Um, and yet, as we read on in this story, something completely different happens. And uh, this is my first point, really. Are we moving? It's only a little picture of a couple of small children being compassionate to one another <coughs> and loving one another. So as we read on in that passage, uh, we discover that the crowd followed Jesus. You know, they'd heard about him. They wanted to be here, be with him. They wanted to be around him. And probably 
you know, in this day and age, when something happens around the world or on, um, even in our own city or on our own town, because of media, because of social media, we quickly hear what's going on in the world. We, we hear it almost instantly. If somebody passes away, if there's a, a natural disaster in the world, um, we're hearing about it within seconds, if not minutes, um, of what's going on and what's happening. But obviously, those things didn't exist in, in, at this time. And so probably a lot of the people who were wanting to spend time with Jesus, wanting to be around him, um, were probably totally unaware of what had happened to John the Baptist. They probably weren't even aware that um, he'd, he'd lost his life. And so they're gathering, they're coming around and they're wanting to be around Jesus. And um, it just really hits me that when you, you know, when you read in verse 14, that Jesus landed, saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them. Despite all that was going on for, for Jesus, despite the fact that he was grieving about his cousin, despite the fact that he'd removed himself to try and just get his head around that and prepare for how is he going to deal with that and what's he going to do next, these people come in and, um, and he has compassion. And obviously that manifests itself there in that verse by, you know, he initially starts to heal their sick. He wants to care. He wants to do something about it. And it made me think about how, how do I fare in those kind of situations? Maybe it's not as extreme as Jesus was with losing his cousin and, you know, the few moments after. But even in times when it's a bit inconvenient, how is my compassion? How is my love for others in those situations? You know, maybe we're hurrying home. You know, maybe we're already running late. Maybe we've already decided we've got lots of things to do. Um, I remember a time where um, we were actually on our way taking our children to school. Um, we used to live in a different part of Derby and we used to have to take the kids to school in the car every morning. And uh, I remember we were um, in the car on the way, rush hour traffic. We, to be honest, we were probably running a little bit late. And um, as we came down onto the A52, a car had broken down on the inside lane. And obviously um, everything was kind of backed up. Everyone was queuing. Everyone was trying to get around from just the impact of just one car going from two lanes down to one was quite huge. And um, I thought, I know we're going to be late. I know we're running late. But actually this could, something here could happen quite nicely. Something ha here could happen quite good. And I felt like God provoked me to say you should offer to help. So I said to um, Helen, I said, look, can you pull over, drop me off and um, either go off to school and I'll carry on and I'll walk into work afterwards because, you know, we didn't want the kids to be late. I think that's what happened. Or we might have just waited, I can't remember. But anyway, I got out of the car, I went over to the car and knocked on the window. There's two young lads in there, not very old at all. Uh, old enough to drive, obviously. Um, but um, I just said, what's going on? He goes, oh, car won't start. We phoned for recovery, but we don't know how long they'll be. And I said, look, we're not far from a little lay-by. And if we can push the car from where you are into the lay-by, um, you know, it will hopefully clear everything and be a really helpful. And so they said, oh, great. So I said, right. So, you know, you need to take your handbrake off. That would be a good start. And then, you know, there's two of you in the car. Do you think one of you might want to come and lend me a hand as we try and move this car back? They're like, oh, yeah, 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 all right. So we managed to move it back into the lay-by. Um, and then everyone was able to, uh, to get on with what they're doing. Now, I'm not trying to say that like, oh, look at how, you know, wonderful and amazing I am. But I just think there are always opportunities to be compassionate and to be thinking about others. You know, there's always times when we can um, have a look around and see what we can do. In Matthew 22, um, Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, you know, it's to love God, but it's also to love your neighbour as yourself. There's always opportunities to show compassion and to show love. And sometimes those times are going to cut across our plans. They're going to cut across the things that we're supposed to be doing. And sometimes that can be a bit frustrating. And I don't know about you, but I have to catch myself because initially I can probably be doing it with not a very good attitude and a very good heart. Like, oh, for goodness sake, I'm going to be late or that's, this isn't what I was planning to do. But as, as we show God's love, as we demonstrate compassion, as we care for people, something about his spirit comes through us and out of us. And then I kind of think, do you know what, this was totally the right thing to do. This was totally, you know, and if I'm late for something, I'm late for something. 
Um, Helen will tell you, um, I'm always late for things. And she's, she's like, one of the most frustrating things about you is when you're late and you come into the, to the family home and say, I'm really sorry I'm late. She said, you've always got a really good reason. You've always got a really good story. And that's really frustrating because I really want to be you know, cross with you. But um, when I, t I have to say, I don't make up stories. There is always a good reason why, uh, why that happens. So what else from this passage? So compassion and a heart for others, I believe, is a key in what we're doing in our walk. Um, it's key for me in terms of what I'm doing within Derby City Mission. Um, it's always about showing God's love. You know, many people can talk about Derby City Mission and kind of maybe some people say, well, you know, where's the gospel gone in that? Where, why are you proclaiming the gospel as much? But um, one of the things I think is that, you know, we're in no way looking not to talk to people about Jesus and have those experiences and pray with people but I also think our actions can say an awful lot as well so we're about both we're about social action and we're about the gospel and bringing those two things together we're an ecumenical charity that's trying to help the church to be more active in what it's doing and um, I think I was just talking to Aaron before you know the benefit of Derby City Mission is we've got the things set up we've got the project sale we got the things happening so just for people to say actually i can give a bit of time is fantastic and that's what we're you know we're looking for really people to just volunteer some time and we can then help be effective and be useful in what we're doing but we're always keen to pray we're always keen to share the gospel um i remember a couple of years ago we were sat with a local authority uh, who were wanting to give us a lot of money to do lots of amazing things and um one of the things i said is look the thing you need to really understand is that we are a Christian charity, not just in name, but actually we're a Christian charity in terms of what we do. So we like to talk to people about Jesus, we like to pray for people, and uh, we like to introduce them to Jesus if they want to. And, uh, you know, what we don't need is constraints put on us by accepting funding. So if you're going to say to us, you can't talk about Jesus or you can't pray for people if we give you this funding to do some more work which is the work I'm actually ended up doing across the whole of Derbyshire then actually we we believe God wants us to do something so we'd rather not have the money because we want we believe that we want to pray and we want to talk to people about Jesus and uh, it was quite funny the local authority said to us they said well we don't really get this faith thing but what we do see is that it makes a difference to the work you're doing so if we're going to ask you to work with us and help us, we'd be silly to ask you to leave that bit out because it obviously has a difference and makes a difference for the work you're doing, which is fantastic. And I just think we've always got to be looking for that compassion and heart for others. So my second point is the immediate need has to be met. You know, when we see in the passage, the day progresses. We saw in verse 13, it talked about Jesus being in that solitary place. And so the disciples are aware of this. It's a remote place. And, um, you know, bless them. I sometimes really feel for the disciples because you feel like they're always wanting to try and do the right thing. They're always really wanting to help. And, um, and yeah, I don't think the disciples did anything wrong in this story. And yet still, it wasn't quite the right thing. You know, they went to Jesus going, look, it's getting late. We're aware of the time. We're right out here. Everyone's come out to find you, to see you. And, uh, you know, I think we should send everyone away to get something to eat. You think, yeah, that makes sense. Good on the disciples. Um, and yet Jesus wanted to do some, something completely different. And sometimes I'm really challenged that, you know, occasionally, probably more than occasionally, um, I think I know better than Jesus. You know, when he's asking us to do things or we've got plans or we've got ideas and we think, no, 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 I think this is the best way to go, Jesus. This is the best thing to do. And I always feel for the disciples because I think I, I, that's exactly how I'd be. I'd be coming up with ideas. I'm an ideas man. That's, you know, that's how I feel like God has given, gifted me. But sometimes they're not always God's ideas. Some of them are my own. And um, I'm always coming up with them and I think I know best. And yet Jesus knew what to do in that situation but there was an immediate need that needed to be met first and Jesus wanted to show his power through his people you know if we don't meet the immediate need sometimes that presents to us how will people even want to listen to what we've got to say you know I was talking earlier on with Carissa about this project recovery lunch we we operate on a Wednesday every Wednesday and um, you know we just we just open the doors of a church for a couple of hours 
Uh, we offer food, we offer drink, we offer conversation, we offer Jesus. You know, we've, um, we share, we have a, a five, ten minute moment each time we meet together just to talk about him. Um, but if people are coming in hungry and we're trying to talk to them about Jesus, it's quite difficult. You know, we've got to meet that initial need. We've got to do that first. I was reminded um, as I was preparing for this of um, a colleague of mine, a lady called Chandra, who helped initiate um, Derby Church's night shelter six years ago. And um, she always reminds me of a time when um, one of the guys who was staying in the night shelter was um, sleeping rough. Um, he was, you know, in and out of the night shelter. He, he wasn't a well guy. And... Um, he came to the door of Derby City Mission and uh, Chandra tells me that she remembers him knocking on the door and, uh, and her thinking, oh no, he's going to ask me for accommodation and we've not sorted him anything out yet. He's going to ask me about clothes, but we've not got any of those yet. Oh, I don't know if I want to answer the door because I just don't know how I'm going to be helped, uh, able to help this person. We've got no food here at the mission. Um, and she was just like, God, just help me in this situation. And she opened the door and she said, oh, hi, are you all right? You know, kind of ready for this demand or this you know stuff that she probably wasn't going to be able to deal with and he just said um is, is there any chance i could have a piece of paper and she was like um yeah yeah i think we can do that so she went off got the paper he goes and a pen please i'd really i feel like while i've been staying in the night shelter i'd really like to get back in touch with my family and i just think i'd like to write to them and um she was like that for her was the immediate need that needed to be met you know this guy didn't need food at that time he didn't need clothing he didn't need accommodation and sometimes we can be so focused in what we think people need that we can miss the opportunities we've got because out of that then that guy because of the paper and the pen and the letter writing he was reconnected with his family but also he was more able to open himself up to our help and our support and we managed to get him off the streets and into accommodation but I think I wonder how we are as well um, you know how do we respond when we see people in need? Um, you know, do we see it sometimes as an inconvenience? Um, you know, or do we have a heart to do something? But sometimes we're not really sure what it is we should be doing, but we see a need and we want to respond to that. And I think for me, that's one of the main appeals, especially about, I, you know, I tend to do quite a lot of my work around um, debt and benefit advice and homelessness. And um, I say to people, look, if... If you want to help, just come and talk to us. We'll find you a way of doing that, of finding a way of working that out. Don't just kind of think, oh, you know, if you've got a desire to help. And, you know, for me, one of the things I say is if, if you're good at drinking tea and coffee and you're good at talking, then come and have a chat with us. Because they are, they are, for me, some of the main skills that we're looking for in the people that we're, we're working with. But it's about meeting that immediate need first before we kind of have a perspective or an idea of what else might be going on or what else might be happening. And then my final point really is just around um, from the little, God can do a lot. From the little, God can do a lot. And in verse 19, you know, this is where Jesus performs his miracle. You know, they've got these five loaves and these two fish in, um, you know, in John chapter 6, he talks about that they belong to a small boy. Um, that's the only time that it talks about that. But when we talk about the feeding of 5,000, we always talk about the little boy who had his five fish, um, five loaves and two fish. And, um, and as I was um, preparing today, I, I like to read lots of different kind of translations, interpretations of the Bible to just kind of get my head around the passage. And I was, I was reading some and then I thought, actually, I'll listen to some because that's usually quite good as well, listening to scripture. You kind of sometimes hear something different. And as I was listening to the story um, on an audio version that I've got, um, it made me think about if I was in that situation. So there's about 5,000 people come to Jesus. Everybody's hungry. Uh, we're miles away from the local Tesco's or wherever it might be. And we're thinking, how are we going to feed everyone? And then there's kind of a bit of a plea put out. Has anyone got anything? And I've gone prepared. I've thought, I know I'm going to somewhere solitary and remote. I know that I'm going to be there for a while. I'm going to take my pack up. I'm going to be all prepared. And then a plea goes out. And I just think, there's 5,000 people here. How is my little pack up going to make any impact here? Any indentation? 
I just guess I began to think, would I even consider offering it up? Because I'd be like, well, I'm all right. I bought my pack up. Don't need to worry about anybody else. But actually, it's about having that little and presenting that to God and saying, this is what I can bring. This is what I can offer. And then Jesus taking it and performing that amazing miracle. You know, lots of people talk about lots of different reasons why that miracle happened and try to kind of, you know, normalise it and say, well, it would have been that, the, you know, the five loaves were massive and the fish were huge and it was obvious that it was going to feed everyone. You know, ultimately, I believe in Jesus, that he is the performer of miracles. Um, but the thing that I love about this story is that the miracle was performed through his disciples. Jesus was there. Jesus was gathering. Jesus was saying, hey, what have we got? Jesus could have easily gone, you know, I'm performing this miracle, everyone look. But actually, he was wanting the disciples to see what resources they have, to see the little that they could bring, to see what they could muster together. And then he chose to work through them. You know, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9, it says that we are God's co-workers, that God is wanting to work with us and he is wanting to work through us. So that same miraculous incident that happened all them years ago, as we read in the Bible, those same miracles happen today. You know, they, Jesus can work through us with the little that we can bring. He can do an awful lot and he's always wanting to. You know, um, it might surprise you to know that I've not always been very comfortable or confident standing up in front of people. Lots of people tell me, you know, you're very eloquent. You can, you know, talk, talk a lot. That's true. <laughs> um, but I wasn't always that way. I was a real shy young man, um, probably up to about the age of 18. Um, I became a Christian when I was about 16. Um, but I was still very shy, lacked lots of confidence, struggled to speak publicly or be in front of anybody. And yet God, I, I kind of just pray to God and say, God, I really want to be used. Whatever that is, I wasn't expecting to have opportunities to speak and that kind of thing. But I just went to God with my little and I said, I've got a little of faith. I've got a little desire. I've got, a, you know, I'm not, I'm not particularly gifted in anything amazing. You know, I wasn't some great musician or, you know, I wasn't, didn't have any, you know, I was one of those people that was probably all right at a lot of things rather than really good at one thing. Uh, but I just said, God, I want to be used. And from that day, God just took me. I've had some amazing opportunities God's given me. I've, you know, had opportunities to travel all over the world and speak to lots of different people. And, um, and yet it was about me bringing my little and then God working through me to do that. And I'm always grateful for what God does through me. And that's, you know, that is my testimony about what God's done. So what can we learn from this passage this morning? Well, I just think there's those three simple things, really. Compassion and others should be key in our life. We need to be open and available, looking for opportunities. It doesn't have to be in the things that we're serving in. It doesn't, you know, for me, I could quite easily go, oh, I'm, you know, it's, I'm on my Derby City mission time now, right? I'm going to be compassionate. I'm going to be caring for others. But it's constantly looking for God, to ask God for, to soften our spirits, to ask him to soften our hearing. Um, to look for how we have to meet the immediate need in people first be, before we look to do anything else. You know, when we're going into circumstances and situations that we're sensitive to enough to know what it is that those people need at that time, rather than us thinking, we know what you need. You know, when we work with homeless people enough, a lot in Derby City Mission, we always think, oh, what they need, their solution is housing, it's accommodation. But actually there are a whole host of other things that we need to try and help them with and support them with first before they're even ready for accommodation. And that from our small offering, God can do a lot. Now, as I was um, just preparing for this morning, um, one of the things I like to do is I like to go out and pray and spend time in the countryside. And actually, Helen and I and Cruz actually came with us because we couldn't leave them at home on our own. Um, we went out for a walk, and I just wonder if I could just show that other PowerPoint on there. I think we've just about got time. Have we got time? It'll be like two or three minutes. It was just, we went out. Um, it should just run itself, I think. Um, some of you might recognise this place or not. It's Cork Abbey. Um, 
Anyone been to Cork Abbey? A few people. We love National Trust. Um, just getting out and walking around. And uh, we went to Cork Abbey um, just a couple of Fridays ago. I just said, you know, I'm going to go away. We're going to, Helen and I, we're going to spend some time praying. I'm going to kind of begin to think about what it is exactly God would want to say to Springwood this morning and the passage and, you know. And as we were walking, one of the things I felt like God spoke to me about was um, actually looking at a different part. Cork Abbey's a maze, like this, obviously that house that we saw at the beginning, but then there's just loads of grounds that you can go walking around. And whenever we've gone to Cork Abbey, if I'm honest, we've always gone, um, kind of, we've either gone to the house, gone to the gardens, or we've always done this kind of same route, basically, around, kind of, usually when we were the kids, because they're usually telling us, we don't want to walk, we don't want to do it, don't make us go. And, uh, and then when we've gone and we've done it, they're like, oh, I really enjoyed that. It was really good fun. Anyone else got children like that? <laughs> or is it just us? <laughs> um, so we always tend to use do this similar route because it's about right. Um, now, Helen will tell you that, um, unfortunately, I'm not very good at estimating how long a walk's going to take. So I have a bit of a reputation in our family that if Dad says, let's go on this walk, Everyone else says, well, that's going to be a whole day, isn't it? It's going to take us forever. And it always takes a lot longer than I ever thought. But one of the things was, I felt like God was saying, actually, I want you to go and explore a different part of Cork Abbey's grounds. I want you to go somewhere different. And so we set out on this walk. Um, and these pictures were just some of the ones that we took as we went around. Um, and it was part of Cork Abbey I'd never seen. It was parts of the estate I'd never seen and never um, experienced before. And... Um, I felt like God really spoke to me for you as a church this morning. And, I, and it was just interesting. Um, I heard at the beginning of the service talking about this step of independence. And it might be to do with that. I don't exactly know. But I felt like God would want to say to you as a Springwood church that there is, it's not a comfortableness, but you know, you know where you're at. You know what you're doing. You know where you're going. You know your vision. You know what your mission is and how you're wanting to do stuff. I've loved this morning that time after time I've heard, you know, in songs and in prayers about Oakwood and that desire to have an impact on this area. And yet I felt like as well that God would want to say to you this morning, there is so much more and there are other things that I want to show you, Springwood. And there are other things I want to reveal to you. And I felt like God was just saying, you know, don't kind of just not settle but get fixed or set on what it is that you feel like you're doing because I feel like there's something else I feel like there's something else and as we we did this walk which took a whole lot longer than we anticipated it was going to um, I just felt like as I was walking in that to, to just say to Springwood Church this morning I've got more for you there's something else for Springwood Church that you've not quite seen yet that you've not quite experienced but it's here and it's not far away it's not like you've got to do something completely different because as we walked around Cork Abbey Estate, as we've done so many times, it wasn't like we were going somewhere completely different, but it was we were experiencing something new. And I just felt like that was something that I just wanted to leave with you this morning. Weigh it, obviously consider it. If it's a load of rubbish, throw it away. But I just felt like it was something that God would want to say to you this morning, that you know, there's, a new, there's something else for Springwood Church. Um, and you're on the cusp of it and you're there in it and um, I just want to also say thank you thank you for having me and thank you for what you're doing here in Oakwood being that light being Springwood Church on this estate and bringing Jesus into the heart of this area it's just fantastic every well I say every Friday night some Friday nights I actually play five-a-side football over the road at um, Springwood Church with some of the guys from my church and um, it was just great to come thinking actually there's a church just meets up the road that's fantastic. It's exciting to know that that's happening, that you're here and that you're being Jesus. So I'm just going to pray, if that's all right, and then uh, hand back to Alex. So yeah, Lord, I want to thank you for Springwood Church. I want to thank you for these people and probably numbers of others who couldn't be with us this morning for various reasons. Would you bless them and be with them? And uh, Father, I thank you for the work they're doing here on Oakwood. And Father, I just pray this morning that some of what I felt like you wanted to share this morning around being compassionate, about caring for others, about looking at fulfilling those immediate needs first before we're able to do anything else. And actually, the, the small that we can bring, 
that you can do so much with it. Lord, I pray for Springwood Church that they would bring what they have and that you would multiply it and do amazing things through it. I pray, Lord, that you would bless this church, that you would continue to do all that you're doing through it. And uh, Lord, I look forward to hearing more and more testimony and stories from this place of things that you're doing here. And Lord, we thank you for our time here this morning. In your name, Jesus. Amen.